Hi, I'm Jack Draper. Shout out to Quality Shot Tennis. Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. I'm really pleased to be joined by Gil Gross and we're going to be reviewing the Roland Garros 2023 tournament. It's becoming a bit of a habit. Uh, Gil, how are you doing? Good, Faisan. How are you? Great to be I'm back. Good. I'm good. It is, well, yeah, it's good to have you back. Good to have you back. No, all good. All good. And uh, of course, actually some people, including some of my commentators on the channel, were saying that they've been listening to your commentary on T2 during Roland Garros and uh, they were saying, you know, Oh, I was listening to Gil and some of the stats you were giving out. So, clearly doing a really good job. So, kudos on that as well. And obviously, covering the grass season. Uh, so, I'm sure we'll get your thoughts on that either in this video or at some point as well. But uh, first of all, let's start off with the men. And of course, the, the biggest headline is you know, Novak Djokovic, of course, 23rd slam, record breaking, overtaking a down 22. Uh, now he's for the first time in the front on the Grand Slam race. And it looks like he's going to stay there for the foreseeable future. And look, I mean, I, I don't think he really had to play his best tennis to get to the title in the end as well. Um, but he played pretty clinically in the end in that Casperud final, although pretty topsy-turvy uh, in the end. At the start, anyway, it looked like we might get a very interesting match, which uh, in the end, at least a fight from Casperud. And we'll touch upon him in a bit. But Djokovic, I mean, how did you see his tournament? And did you pick him as the winner as well for the tournament beforehand? No, no, I picked Alcaraz. Um, I thought that the conditions in that matchup, I did predict the semifinal to happen. Uh, I felt the conditions in that matchup were ideal for Alcaraz and a lot of the things that I anticipated Novak could could have the advantage over Carlito San would have been somewhat diminished by the slower conditions. I didn't account enough for the value of handling a moment like that mentally and staying calm, managing the stress and the nerves that come with such a big match. A lot of that was also down to just Alcaraz's incredible record in finals. There was a point in time last year where I thought he was struggling with his nerves, but it had been a while since I'd seen it. So it was kind of out of mind. Uh, but this was a completely different story. There was a massive buildup to this semifinal. We were all waiting for it. Uh, it was N Novak Djokovic at a at a major. Uh, Alcaraz has never had that experience before. He wasn't quite ready for it. And Djokovic also played great tennis that kind of rendered the intensity of that match or dialed up the intensity of that match to a 10. Plus the weather. I mean, it all, it all added up to Alcaraz not being able to do it physically. S uh, and then also kind of coming in, remember the elbow issue for, for Novak that uh, I never thought went away. I don't think it was gone at any point, even in Rome when at times the sleeve was off and at times it looked better. Uh, but the, the Runa performance in the quarterfinal just wasn't all that good. I wasn't really positive still. I'm not completely positive on why he pulled out of Madrid, but I think it was the elbow. So we never really saw a good version of Novak Djokovic in the lead up to Roland Garros, but, uh, and, and by the way, that's not new. I mean, that is new. Uh, generally, we've seen him maybe not at his best at the start of clay court season, but by Rome, it's always looked good. So this was kind of new territory. It's the worst he's ever looked coming into the French Open, and it just didn't matter because uh, I thought his tennis was really good. There were moments, sure, that that he had to battle very, very hard, I think, against good players. Uh, I think you know it, it all had to do with kind of beginning of the match tension more than anything else, uh, especially after the davidovich Fakina win. But each each match he finished in dominant fashion. Like the rude match, obviously the second and the third set. Uh, even though Casper played a good third, the Hatchinov match, the the third and the fourth set were not close. The Fuchovic match, the last three sets were not close. The Davidovic Fakina match, the third set wasn't close. So in all of these matches, Novak found his best tennis by the end. Yeah, no, no, I agree. It's hard to disagree with your points and it's interesting the point on Alcaraz that you said you know you picked him to win and actually to be fair so did I not to actually win the tournament but to beat Djokovic I went a bit left field and wild and went for an Alcaraz Runa final with Runa to win uh, because I thought I'd be a bit crazy but then as soon as I saw the Surundalo match I was like okay this is probably not going to happen because he's just played a really grueling match uh, but yeah the Alcaraz Djokovic one was interesting because going into it I was thinking I was umming and ahhing and I I couldn't quite understand why Djokovic wasn't the favourite going into it. 
uh, because even though I'd picked Alcaraz to win, obviously Djokovic with the 22 slams and the experience and the know-how and how he manages his body and he picks the right time. Uh, I guess it might be to do with the fact that, as you said, this clay court season hasn't been ideal preparation or wasn't ideal preparation going into it because normally he either wins Rome or goes, makes the final and goes deep in it and tends to peak just before Roland Garros and then manages his first week really well. But uh, as you said, I think he plays some really, really good tennis um, in definitely in spurts, I thought. And when it really mattered, I mean, the six tiebreakers didn't lose a single one, one and then also no unforced errors in those tiebreakers, which is just like unheard of, just went into lockdown mode. And, you know, the mental strength that he showed uh, in tight moments was really key as well. So uh, it was a bit of a shame that Alcaraz obviously suffered with the cramps and I was a bit surprised that he did suffer with nerves as well, uh, mainly because I thought he might just rise to the occasion. I think he did, obviously, for the first two sets. Um, but a shame that he cramped because who knows, I thought it was shaping up to be an all-time classic. Uh, in all honesty, I was doing, um, obviously not on T2 like yourself, or uh, I'm not sure whether you're commentating on that, but uh, on the channel, I was doing some play-by-play. And after the second set, which was a really high level, and obviously Alcaraz had to really dig deep and won at 7-5, I thought that's one of the best sets of tennis I've seen all year. And I was really looking forward to see the rest of the match. Then obviously we got that uh, crampy in at one all in the thirds, which is a massive, massive shame. So, uh, you know, who knows what might have happened. But Djokovic, I think he has that aura about him, even with, against someone like Alcaraz in the best of five. And it shows you how tough it is, uh, even for someone like Alcaraz to potentially deal with it, not necessarily just physically, but mentally as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, incredible... Uh, performance and I thought the final in the second and third sets and I saw you say it on Twitter as well and I have to agree the serve on forehand I mean the forehand was I don't want to exaggerate but I thought it like Del Potro at Wimbledon like the way that he was striking in the, in the second and third set it looked that good uh, and I, I just couldn't believe how well it was hitting after such a weird uh, first set against Gasparud but yeah um, in, in terms of like accomplishments and accolades and everything and I know obviously you don't really like the the GOAT debate and all of that. So I won't ask you that specifically, but what I will ask is, is it now very hard to argue against Djokovic being the best? But yeah. Is what yeah. I'll ask. Sure. I mean, I, th I think there are two, maybe I can get to three uh, schools of thought. Uh, you're either, you're either arguing or, or labeling, um, that Novak Djokovic is is the greatest of all time, or you're saying there's none and it's not a good question, and uh, there are are reasons why it's it's always going to be unclear and no one is ever going to deserve that title. I mean, certainly at this point, though, if if you are, you know, it, it's no longer a matter of it doesn't seem at least of of suggesting that it's Federer, suggesting that it's Nadal. It's uh, it's probably either Novak or no one, or there's, you know, you're, you're taking at, you're, you're taking it from a more uh, personal level and you're, you're admitting, well, uh, Roger or Rafa is my goat, uh, maybe not the goat. And, and that, that is fine. That is fine. Everybody's going to have their, their favorites, but uh, yeah, it's, empirically objectively there there are no uh i don't think there are any great arguments for for federer or nadal yeah no 100 percent. and everyone on the channel knows i'm i'm a nadal fan but the, i was the first person to say after he won that i it's, i mean it's, it's so so hard to to argue against it and i think the slams are such a big part of it uh, and given that they've all played in the same era as well, I feel like if they hadn't played in the same era, then you can kind of start saying, oh, you know, well, different generations and rules and surfaces and they played differently. And and maybe you can start talking about that. But I just think what he's done and weeks at number one and all the ATP Masters titles and all the other all the other accolades that he has to boot, it's just it's very hard to to go against. it. And the biggest thing as well is it's not just going to be one slam, most likely. Uh, he's going to play more. We don't know when he's going to slow down. He's probably he might have four or five years left in him. Nadal's going to retire in twenty twenty four anyway. I don't know if he's going to win another Slam. Nadal, so 
uh, Djokovic is now on for the calendar slam. So he's all slowing down. And someone asked him, I think, after and said, you know, are you thinking about retiring? Or, you know, like, you know, when are you going to finish? And he's like, why would I even think about it? I've just won Roland Garros. I'm thinking about Wimbledon. And mm-hmm. he's going to go into that bigger favourite than he did here. So, look, I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see how the year pans out. But uh, as you said, like, statistically, it's, it's impossible to go against him. Um very very quickly on the on the calendar slam. I mean, do you think he could do it? Is this a is this the best chance he has? Obviously, has one match away in twenty twenty one, but given the field, there's not going to be any Nadal on grass. You know, Kyrgios, I saw him play uh, today or yet was it today or yesterday, and he just didn't. Obviously, he's still not fully fit. Clearly, um, there's other players as well on grass, but Berrettini didn't look very good either uh, yesterday as well. What, what do you think? What do you think? I, I'm under 50% on it. Uh, I I would have Djokovic winning Wimbledon at maybe, you know, well above 50%, maybe maybe uh, 75%. Oh, because I, I just, it sounds almost like it should be higher, but you got to remember, I mean, it, no one, it's still winning seven matches. It's still winning a major. It's never, it's never as probable as, as almost you think it is for, for the favorites. That's just how, how the sport goes. Uh, so yeah, but I would have it at a very impressively high number of like 75%, but then U S open, uh, I would have probably around 40%. I think y- you, I really respect the field. I think there's a lot of hardcore players who are challenging. And I think at the end of the calendar, it's, uh, it, it's physically difficult. 40% uh, still likely makes him, it, not likely, it absolutely makes him the favorite uh, because nobody has better than 40% chance. But still, if you add up those those percentages, which are just off the top of my head, kind of feeling out, like picking a number. Uh, so, you know, there's nothing scientific about the numbers that I came up with, but you add those together, you're under 50%. And I, I think it's, I mean, it's the, what, I think it's the third time that he's won the Australian Open uh, and Roland Garros, so... It, it's uh look it's tough and and Nadal did it a couple of years ago it, it's he's halfway there it's uh there's almost never to me i think talking about it during wimbledon is a little premature he wins wimbledon now you go into the us open and it's unavoidable but right now i mean there's there's two majors to win that's that's a big deal yeah no no agreed and the us open is a weird one cuz it always seems to be like a bit of a lottery uh, we've had so many different winners as well over the yep. years. So I think that's definitely going to be an interesting one. Obviously, he w- wasn't able to play it last year. So uh, we'll see uh, how he gets on this year. But yeah, I mean, uh, I guess we can finish up on Djokovic in terms of uh, what were you most impressed by uh, this Roland Garros in terms of you know what he showed in his route to the final winning it as well. Um, I, he's obviously won so many majors and he has so many different assets to his game physically and mentally. But what really stood out to you uh, a couple of things that you were impressed by during the tournament. Well, uh, I think, I think first of all, he, he kind of showed that the fitness is, is not gone. It's still very much there. Uh, the Davidovich Fakina match was unbelievably physical. And that was the first time I think all year, because I don't really think we saw this in Australia. We didn't have to. So first time I, I, Novak was able to confirm to me as a, as an observer that, Oh, okay. He's, he can still be a, a cardio monster for lack of a better term. He can still play uh, a lot of long rallies and come out of it looking pretty good. And his, he can still have a shot tolerance advantage against some of the toughest players in the world in, in the lengthy rallies. He certainly used that in the final against Rude, I I've been highlighting the first three points of the tie break. That was a 16 shot rally, a 15 shot rally and a 14 shot rally back to back to back this is the first set. And Novak had to defend in all three points and he won all three points. It's remarkable. So I, I think that was the first thing, uh, the forehand, which was massive at the Australian open. He was flattening it, flattening it out and really using it as a big weapon. That, uh, we didn't really see that come out again f- after January, but I thought here at, at Roland Garros, once again, the forehand 
was uh, a pretty dominant force, which it needs to be on clay. It's always his key on clay. And then after that, just the nerve management, which I, I don't know if that's the thing that impressed me most because it's uh, it's been a part of, of his game, especially since 2018, where he's just, uh, he raises, he, he elevates his game in the biggest moments, uh, which is really hard to do. I think, I think if you can keep your game the same in the biggest moments, then you're above average in tennis. Uh, that you're in great shape if you can just stay the same. Most players get worse, but if Novak gets better, which it really seems he does because he locks in and he focuses and he he digs deep physically, uh, because Novak's getting better in these moments, he's dominating these moments. So I think those are the three things. Yeah, no, hard to disagree. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the the last point I think is just so key, isn't it? And it's that's when people say, you know, he, he was just so clutch in the big moments and the crucial moments. He it, it's, it really makes the di big difference because that first set, for example, in the final against Rude, it was, you know, you could argue Rude, does he take it before the tiebreaker? He had, he had chances to, didn't do it, goes to a tiebreaker and then it's like, okay, it's a, you'd assume it's a lottery, but actually Djokovic, it's not a lottery when it comes to tiebreaker and it obviously wasn't Roland Garros and he just raises level. Um, when it really mattered the most and said, no, I'm not, not going to let you take it. Now this is mine. Um, and he did against H Hatchinov as well. The tiebreaker beat him seven, love and one. Then the tiebreaker, which was just incredible, um, especially after the way that he lost the first set and Hatchinov played a really, really high level in that first set. So yeah, I mean, impressive, really impressive. And I think he is definitely a mental giant of the game and might go down arguably as the best in that, uh, not just the accolades, et cetera, as well, but specifically in that aspect of, of tennis as well. Uh, talking of Kasparud in the final, uh, were you impressed with him in the tournament? I think, you know, I didn't actually have him making the final, to be fair. Uh, I had him falling a bit earlier and I was impressed with how the forehand started to look a lot more of a weapon like he did last year on his route to the final. Of course, he hasn't had the best of years so far um, up until Roland Garros, but then he started to peak. Obviously, he made the semifinals of Rome, which is a good result. Uh, and then managed to repeat the victory over Holger Rune in the quarterfinals, although Holger Rune obviously a little bit tired and fatigued from the Sorundolo match, you could say. Uh, and then clinical performance in the semifinals against Zverev, begging him in the third set as well. And the final, I think, I think you said, just uh, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, that it was his best final performance. And obviously he took a set of outcries at the US Open, but I think performance-wise, I tend to agree because, you know, I think if you compare the final performance this year compared to last against the Dove. And um, one of the biggest things I looked at was actually the backhand and backhand returns and also in rallies. Uh, last year, it was a lot more loopy, a lot less pace, uh, a lot shorter as well. Like it, well, he was getting punished completely and Nadal was just picking him off. Uh, I'm not saying that he was out hitting Djokovic backhand to backhand, but there were some instances where actually he managed to stay with him, which I thought was quite impressive. And, Djokovic, when he wasn't playing his best, might actually make an error and he'd actually win a couple of those points. And even on the return, uh, especially in the first set, I thought he read the Djokovic serve well and actually returned on the backhand side. Uh, and he got to neutral pretty quickly in that in those instances. So uh, that was a big positive. And the forehand as well, he managed to stick with Djokovic. And as you said earlier, in the third set, Djokovic played a really high level. And the fact that he managed to stay with him until 5 all uh, probably shows that you know he has upped his game in some sense as well. And I do think his calmness as well and his ability to choose the right moments to come to the net are also quite impressive as well. I think he's a very good player at the net, um, which I think is a great asset to have in his game as well. So overall, I, I was quite impressed with him in this tournament. But what was your read on it? Yeah, I thought he played pretty much as well as he can. His record in big finals, you know, he, he's it, he's made five of them. He hasn't won any of them. I'm including Miami. I'm including the year-end championships. You know, he didn't. He, he's the underdog in all of those matches. Uh, the one knock against Rude, and I, I think it might still be true. I don't know because uh, is is that you know he just doesn't really have an A plus win in his career. Big tournament, uh, one you know elite player, tier one player. And I think ordinarily I would have said, okay, Runa is kind of that win. Uh, Runa it, is his first top 10 win at a major. But I, I don't know what 
what was Holger Runa in, in that match, really? Uh, certainly for two sets, he was he was a nothing burger. Like, he, he just wasn't there. Zverev apparently has this, this leg injury, which partially describes the level. Now, look, I, I don't think that Zverev was... You know, I, I think he he had a semblance of a game, not not a good one, but it wasn't like wasn't like he was out there limping around. Uh, but Rude dominates him. But now it's like, how does that win age, knowing what we know now about Zverev? So that's the only knock. But ultimately, on paper, this was his best run out of his three runs to a final at a major. This was his best, his two best wins. U.S. Open, he had Berrettini, he had Hachinov. Roland Garros last year, he had a very young Holger Runa, and he had Marin Cilic in the semifinals, miraculously. So, look, this was pretty good. He, there, there are some skill gap things, but ultimately I thought in the final, the reason why I thought it was his best is I think he was asserting his firepower a lot better, uh, particularly his forehand, is that he... He didn't get passive. He didn't get pushed around. He kind of backed that shot as a shot that that needs to be needs to be a force. And if it's not a force, he has no chance. And in some of these matches, like the year end championship against Djokovic last year, Novak's forehand was way better than Casper's. And it's like, okay, if if that's how it's going to go, then what is Rude better? Like, where is Rude yeah. better if you're going to get out forehanded? So I think in this match, he he did do better in, in that regard. But uh, there's still some skill gap stuff on the return to serve and defending the backhand that he needs to try to make up if he's going to win these matches. Yeah, no, 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 agreed 100%. Um, before we move on from Kasparud, actually, just uh, a quick insight. I mean, on grass, does his game translate at all well onto grass uh, is, is my question to you because my feeling is probably not given that I think his game is very clay-centric. Um, or, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's maybe a bit harsh to say that he made the final of the US Open, so clearly he has the tools for the hard hard courts as well. But um, I don't feel like the backhand slice is maybe quite there and uh, his movement on the green stuff. Uh, just a quick word on that. Yeah, he's been horrendous on clay in his career. I'll I'll pull up his record. But, uh, you know, the the forehand, which is has a lot of topspin on it, it just doesn't jump off the court. You want to try to flatten out a little bit if you can, and and he struggles to do that. Uh, plus, he just doesn't have as much time on the ball. Uh, the return of serve is a bit of an issue as well when it's coming really, really quick. So uh, his career record on grass is three and six, and his only win at Wimbledon is against Albert Ramos Vinolas. A fellow clay quarter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't know how much you can read into that. Yeah, well... Let's see. Maybe he'll surprise us. But uh, well, no. I think the goal the goal for Rude, I think, is pretty simple for Grass. It's not, you know, making another final. Yeah, yeah, it's let's do better than we ever have. And exactly, then if, yeah. if, as long as I can do that, I can feel good about it. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Small steps, small steps. Okay, uh, on the men's side, then to wrap up, just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, who, who disappointed you the most, or who maybe underachieved the most on the men's side for you? Well, I think it's. It's kind of hard not to go with Medvedev. Uh, he loses in the first round to uh, Tiago Zaybach-Vilch. And I I really do think that Tiago played a super high level. Like, yeah. easily, easily looked like a top 30 player on court. And I'm being safe. Uh, and particularly with the powerful forehand in the slow and windy conditions, big advantage uh, in that match. Or, or it was, you know, the the thing that kind of turned that match. And Medvedev wasn't able to really hit through the court. But you know, it does it does have to be Daniil. I mean, at the end of the day, he's he's now had two disappointing losses at majors this year. The straight sets to Sebastian Corda and and this loss to uh, Tiago. Other than that, it's been great. You know, the the entire season. Other than that, has been really great. So uh, it's it's just it's hard not to say, Daniil. I don't know if if you want to go into more depth on that match or not. Yeah, yeah, no, I I agree. I think uh, that match was weird because I think <laughs> I think Tiago played really well. And his style is very exciting to watch as well. To be fair, uh, he obviously gets behind the crowd and he's a bit of a character. Uh, but the forehand is is definitely. 
you know, definitely hurt Medvedev as well. I think his level fluctuated big time. His serve wasn't really having much of an effect uh, on him. But yeah, it was, a, it was a disappointment after the Rome victory, I think, uh, because I didn't think he was going to... A lot of people were thinking that he was going to win it or, or go really deep or even in the final. And uh, I don't know where you had him, but I, I thought he might make the quarters, uh, maybe or maybe semi-finals at a push, but I just didn't quite have the belief that he was going to be able to go in a best of five slam and kind of go super deep in it. Um, on clay anyway, but yeah, it's been disappointing on in the, on the slams. But it'll be interesting to see how he gets on on the grass because you'd imagine grass should suit his game. But I think it's more movement. It might be the question mark than anything else. Um, but I've watched him win with him once before, and I think his game is suited. But the one impress impressive thing about Medvedev in Rome was the fact that he adapted his game to the clay, and he he actually was a a lot less stubborn and then just stick and say, I'm just going to hit as flat as I can. And that's my game. He, he did give himself a bit more margin, a bit more height on the ground strokes, a bit more top spin because he knew that while well, I'm a backboard and I can still, I can stick with most people in rallies, if not everyone, I've got incredible shot tolerance. So why shouldn't I do that and give myself a chance? And um, a, a bit of a shame that of course he fell when he did, but um, I wanted to say also on my side, Yannick Sinner, I thought, given the draw opened up, I thought that was a missed opportunity. I know at my yeah. played a high level, but I feel like this seems to be a regular theme with him maybe not going as deep as he should do in slams as well. Well no, I, I, I think he I think this is one of the first times that he's taken a bad loss at a major in, in a long time. I think mm. I think back I think you have to go back to when he lost to Fucevic at Wimbledon. That's the last time that he actually lost to a player who's not technically better than him. Uh but I, I really do think that he's feeling the pressure big time at this point. And I, I think that's what ultimately ended up hurting him. He's had some great moments in 2023. He's gone deep in tournaments. And I think that's actually increased the expectations and increased the desire to win one of these big events, which he has not done. I think it would be a big boost for him if he were able to do it. But Sinner... Sinner still has some issues with his nerves. Uh, I don't, I don't think that he has always kind of maintained control over over the over his nerves uh, at the end of tournaments and and in big spots. And I I just think in that Altmaier match, uh, he he had every chance in the world really there. And I I I just felt he was feeling the pressure a little bit too much. Yeah, no, I agree, agree. And then lastly on the ATP, uh, what was your favorite match of the tournament? Um, maybe Runa Sarundalo, just in terms of the pure drama of it. I, I that's the one that kind of stands out to me. I think I that was just incredible in the in the fifth set, especially. Yeah, it was. It, it's such a weird match as well because the level fluctuated massively, like. It went from like almost challenger level to like oh this is like top five level, um like throughout the sets it was really really weird. I was watching it, uh, which is really strange. I thought Monfils Baez as well. Obviously Monfils yeah. came back in the fifth set. And the atmosphere was amazing, as well as is a great match. But it's weird. There's so many five setters in the first couple of rounds and then barely any. I think there were none after the quarterfinals, um, which is I guess a little bit of a shame, but. Um, yeah, I feel like Alcaraz Djokovic, which could have been, it's just a shame it ended when it did. And well, yeah, it kind of ended up uh, <laughs> with the cramps and everything because hopefully we'll see that match up at, maybe at the US Open uh, or Wimbledon. Again, that'll be good fun, uh, I'd hope. Uh, okay, on to the, is there anything on the, actually on the men's side you want to touch on before you go on to the WTA? No, let's let's uh, let's go on. Cool, okay. So on the WTA side, obviously, Sviontek going back to back at Roland Garros for the first time since Justine Hennon. I think she did it 2004-2006, uh, three years in a row. Uh, uh, impressive performance and came up against a spirited Mukova in the final as well, uh, who was a surprise package, I think, although I don't know whether you picked her to it in the final. Uh, but, I mean, what was your read on Sviontek and her level? I mean, I actually thought her level wasn't the highest, but she managed to to get through it and beat everyone and you know Mukova in the third in the final even played a pretty high level and Shrontex level was yeah as I said it wasn't clinical uh, she went went to three sets the first time ever in a slam final as well 
Um, and, I, and maybe she wasn't tested enough, a lot of people were saying to me, before the final because she wasn't really pushed. Apart from the Haddad Mayer match where she got taken to a tiebreaker, uh, had to save set points. And she did raise her level in that tiebreaker, to be fair. Um, but yeah, not the highest level, but I guess that just shows how good she is on clay. And I feel like there's a real gap between her and the rest. It's a shame we didn't get to see her against Sabalenka, maybe, I guess. But the, I don't think we can really take the defeat in Madrid as a as what would have happened uh, at Roland Garros, no. given the conditions are so different. But uh, yeah, so your your thoughts on Sviontek and her run and uh, the win as well? Yeah, I mean, it's it's ultimately a, a great sign if if after majors you're you're saying, you know, well maybe she didn't dominate, but at the, at the same time, the the crazy thing about where Iga's expectations have have gotten to is like it's almost like the fact that. Uh, Muhova went to a, a third set was a surprise or somehow a disappointment when in reality, like it's a major final, you're allowed to go to a deciding set against a player who's just won six matches. Right. Uh, and then I think ultimately at the very end of the match in crunch time, uh, although I think Iga definitely started to feel the pressure when she had a lead in the second set and there was a level dip there. Uh, but I think once you know, once it hit four all in the third, uh, there were some really amazing winning plays, uh, especially on a break point at four all. And this was, I think, the turning point in the match where uh, Muhova hit a pretty good low slice short in the court. And Sviantek from, you know, her shins really comes up with this cross court backhand approach that was that was a beautiful backhand and she needed it. She got it. Uh, then she got two first serves and got two free points. She held and ended up ended up breaking in the in the next game, playing an awesome point at Love All, where she she made an amazing return on the forehand and then uh, a good safe forehand down the line approach. And Muhova missed the lob long. Um, I think in the in the final. There were a lot of good examples of Iga's forehand and the fact that she forces a lot of errors off of it when she's not necessarily hitting the small targets. She's not necessarily uh, having to change direction or attack with width or take all that much risk. But there, you know, there will be a lot of forced errors from that forehand side where it's the weight of shot doing most of the work, uh, which is a huge luxury for Iga. Yeah, agreed. It's such a heavy shot, isn't it, on the surface? So much yeah. top spin and pace. And not many people on tour are able to soak it up and, and give as good as they get, I think, when it comes to Eager as well. I think that's that's the issue. Uh, but Mukaba, to be fair, applied herself really well, I thought, in the end, given it's her first ever slam final as well against a massive favourite in the final, and we'll touch on her in a second. But um, for Eager, I mean, obviously positive signs, as you said, because, yeah, there, there were still some bagels and breadsticks at the start and that's great but I think it's yeah in that final yeah she was pushed to three sets there were nerves there clearly but she handled them well as you said and came up clutch in the big moments and I guess that's what champions do um, as you said as well but I think in terms of her going forward as well I mean she hasn't had the best of luck on on grass um, I know she won it as a junior but uh, there's a bit more time than last year when she won Roland Garros, in between Roland Garros and Wimbledon, from what I know. So she may have a little bit of time to play a tournament as well. Last year, she wasn't able to. Uh, do you think she might be able to at least go a bit further this year, potentially, uh, given that? She should. Uh, it feels like without you know the win streak and the mental toll that I think that win streak took last year, it ended up being 37 matches. There was, a, I almost think, a sense of dread at Wimbledon about, about, first of all, just how much energy, again, that took, but also, like, feeling like, okay, this is definitely going to come to an end at some point here, surely, right? And it didn't look right from the start mentally for Iga last year at Wimbledon. I, I think this is a much healthier position for her without the the weight of that streak coming in so i i do expect her to to put in a better showing it was somewhat of a meltdown against cornet last year uh just from a tennis standpoint not not a mental standpoint necessarily uh 
I, I also, though, think that Rybakina and Sabalenka should be favorites above Iga, uh, especially just with the, the serving difference there. I mean, that's one of the main areas where they separate themselves from Iga or the category where they separate themselves from Iga is the serve. And we we know how important that is on grass where the first offensive strike is essential. And if you can get it on the serve, that's the ideal. But then also in the return game, they might be able to get that on Iga, returning Iga's serve. Uh, because, you know, Sviantek hasn't improved on that shot all that much. It's been good enough. It continues to be good enough because she's the best baseliner in the world. But I, I think on grass against those aggressive returners, I think Rybakina does it uh, particularly well, returning aggressively against Sviantek. That's a huge challenge. Yeah. No, 100%. I would argue as well, I think the net game, I feel like they've got a, a better net game than Sviontek. I feel like Sviontek, the one positive about that, though, is that she does try to come to the net. I've noticed in the last six months, especially, she's clearly trying to work on that part of her game and, and add it. So she will. she's willing to come forward. She will volley at the net, but she still doesn't look supernatural at the net. There is some awkwardness there. There's some missed volleys, some easy ones. Uh, she doesn't always put it away. I do feel like Sabalenka and Rabakina have better hands in the net. I think they're just generally better at net um, currently. But yeah, the serve is such a big, big difference uh, on grass anyway, um, as you said. And the, her kick serve is not going to be as effective, obviously, on grass, which is uh, so damaging on the clay. Um, interesting as well, before we move on from Sviontek, she's got the best singles uh, winning percentage at Roland Garros now and 93% overtaking Chris Everett on 92%. So fun little fact there, um, just showing how dominant she is on the surface. Uh, let's talk about Mukova then. I mean, she made the final. I wasn't surprised she beat Sakari because she beat her last year and she clearly, uh, that's not a great match for Sakari. And she's, she's clearly talented. She seems to have a bit of an all-court game as well. Made two women on court finals in the last four years. Uh, so she can clearly play on grass. But on the clay, I mean, it was a phenomenal run in the end. Uh, that semi-final against Sabalenka, save match points. Obviously, pushed Liga to three, you were saying. I mean, how impressed were you with her game? And, and I guess, why did she do so well? What, what did she bring uh, to the table? I'm just a huge fan of hers, uh, and I have been for a while. Uh, I don't think she's a clay quarter. I think it might be her worst surface. Maybe hard court, but I think clay might be her worst surface. Ash Barty did the same thing. She, I mean, I, Ash won Roland Garros. She wasn't just a finalist. Uh, but that first big major for Ash was in Paris, and that didn't really make much sense. And I think this is similar in that respect, not to mention the fact that uh, they, they remind me of each other. I mean, uh, Muhova is unbelievably athletic. She uses her athleticism not only on defense, but also with the way she net rushes. Uh, she she executes the delayed approach as well as as any woman I've I've ever seen. Where she'll hit a big forehand, wasn't necessarily an approach shot, but she recognizes, oh, that's a good one, that's a strong one, and she'll come in. Uh, she'll make a late decision to come in. And she'll, make, despite that late decision, make up the ground with her speed and be able to close the net and finish volleys. Does that really, really well. Her topspin backhand is uh, is actually not a major liability. And that's a, a huge difference between most of the players on the WTA Tour who have good slice backhands. Like Cerebus Tormo very limited. Barty even was very limited. Mukova, it's not an amazing two-handed drive backhand, but but she can get it done. She can use it when when she needs it. I think the slice is an awesome weapon in today's tour, though. Uh, you know, we saw how she used it against Iga in spots with the drop shots. Uh, so many players are uncomfortable at net. So many players don't have a slice backhand of their own to counter the slice. And so many players don't want to be pulled into that awkward midcourt position. Mujova can do that. But then also like the meat and potatoes, the stuff that is not really necessarily variety, just the basics of her game. The serve has pop. 
I love the technique on her serve. And the forehand is damaging as well. She has finishing power on the forehand. So I think she checks every box. She hasn't been healthy. It's killed her career. Uh, but even before this run, we have seen that every time she's gone up, gone up against top five and top 10 opponents, she's looked like she, she's right there. She has a winning record against top 10 and top five. So I'm just glad that that she had this this run and this breakthrough. Yeah, I agree. I think she was 5-0 and against top 10, wasn't she, going into the final? Top 5. Or top 5, sorry, even oh, even more impressive. Yeah. Uh, so 5-1 and one now. I mean, that's, that's not a bad <laughs> record to have, is it? And wasn't too far off winning it. But yeah, I mean, she's... I was really impressed with her game, and I have seen a bit of her in the past, but I haven't seen her a huge amount. Uh, and when I saw her play in the matches that she, uh, that she played at Roland Garros, I was thinking that, yeah, her game would be great on grass than I saw obviously quarterfinals twice at Wimbledon. I was like, okay, yep, I do remember that. Um, but her drop shots, I mean, she's got great touch and she has a great all round game and you, you touched upon it in detail. And I think that's what really stood out to me in that her slice is going to be a nightmare at Wimbledon for people. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to struggle. And she hits the slice down the line better than most of the women that I've seen on tour. I mean, it's, it's a really hard, uh, shot to hit well and like with a lot of pace lower than that and deep as well and she does it really really effectively so i'm looking forward to seeing uh, what kind of damage she can do on the green stuff but a really impressive tournament uh, on the clay and uh, you know i think the match against sabalenka will go down as an all-time classic i think because that was clearly a, a great match as well mm -hmm. but uh, yeah i mean surprise package but uh i think a pleasant surprise package to the tournament as well and played a very competitive final, which you don't always get, especially on the women's tour. If someone like Sean in the final, she tends to dominate. So um, yeah, great to see that uh, for sure. In terms of uh, some of the other players then, so I want to ask you in terms of who disappoints you the most um, on the women's tour, uh, who would you pick? Hmm. Can, can, can you give me some candidates here just so that I, I don't miss anybody? Yeah, sure. It's Leila Fernandez, I guess, um, is, is one. Uh, you've got, of course, I guess, Zachary lost in the first round. Jessica Pagula as well. Lost to Elise Mertens with the head-to-head, -head not, I guess, maybe as favourable. Um, I don't think you can say Rebecca because she was ill, of course. Uh, you've yeah. got Ons, Ons Jaber, of course, lost to Haddad May. She was a, a favourite, I guess, going into that, but lost the quarters. Uh, so maybe not a massive, massive um, upset or disappointment. Uh, yeah, those are the first few i guess the spring okay. mind yeah i i mean none of those are none of those are major i mean i think pagula of of all of them may be the most surprising to me yeah uh then again i don't i don't think clay is uh suitable really for for jess pagula she does hit quite flat uh she doesn't really have as much finishing power yeah and i i think when the surface can help her out a little bit in that area and the ball can kind of skid through the court and her depth and her precision can be a little bit more damaging. I think that helps her, uh, but certainly the score line stuck out uh, against Elisa Mertens. I mean, the fact that it was six, one, six, three for a player in Pagula who uh, is always hanging tough. Who's been the, the biggest model of consistency outside of the elite tier of, of, of women's tennis in the last two years easily. Uh, you will not find. I mean, Kuder Matova's made a lot of quarterfinals as well, but Pagula is even uh, a, a peg above. I mean, nobody peg, no, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she has been just a, 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 a rock, a guarantee tournament in and tournament out. Yeah. So I, I would say among, among those, I think yeah, yeah. Jess is probably the most disappointing. Yeah. And actually I forgot the most glaring one, which was critique of her first round, of course. Uh, 2021 champion. Yeah. Obviously, she lost the first one last year, but she was suffering suffering a bit, I think, mentally as well. But she had a really good start to the year, and then she's tailed off, and then <laughs> come into this slam and lost a Serenko in straight sets, which I think good is point. a shame because she was en route to obviously meet Shvionte in the fourth round, and I wanted to see how that'd go, given that she's beaten Shvionte the last couple of times they played as well, not on clay, but um, I thought it would have been interesting to see. Um, how that would have panned out. So a shame we didn't get that. But um, yeah. Another player who uh, probably better on hard court than Clay. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, she, she won Roland Garros. So 
<laughs> so, yeah, it's her only slam as well. So it's like, okay, fair enough. Uh, unless she wins another slam on a hard court, then it is tough to say otherwise, I guess, isn't it? But uh, yeah, and then in terms of match of the tournament, who was your, uh, who was your, um, well, what was your match of the tournament? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the semi, the semi between Sabalenka and, uh, and Mukova. You know, that's a match that certainly delivered at the very end of the tournament. And just, I mean, it's it's fascinating because look, it was a meltdown. You know, it it was a match that at at five two in the third, I I I think everybody watching just thought the match was over and that the the winner was Sabalenka. Uh, Mukova looked to be on empty physically. You have the five two score line. You figure okay, like it's not like it's it's not like it's five four or something, and Mukova might just have to hang in there and you know, maybe try to get this to a tiebreak or something and try to hold up. It's like, no, in order for her to win this match, she's going to have to break serve twice and either win it 7-6 or 7-5. And physically, that looked completely out of the question. But Sabalenka just started a spiral and and Mukova was able to do enough. And it was a, a sh- unbelievably uh, shocking and, and thrilling comeback unless you're a big fan of Arena Sabalenka. <laughs> Yeah, it was. It was definitely, yeah, match of the tournament for me as well. I think it was such a such a good match, and yeah, definitely drama in that third set. But uh, amazing to watch. Yeah, and the the first two sets were also incredible. Yeah, so the tiebreak as well. It had, yeah. yeah, I mean, it had from start to finish high quality. Yeah, a hundred percent. Some great tennis on the show. So uh, who knows? Maybe that would be a great matchup on the grass as well. Both are really good on grass, so that'd be great to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, potentially a rematch of that. Uh, Gil, is there anything you want to touch on before we wrap it up? No, you know, just uh, enjoy this uh, grass court sprint. It's always, it always feels quite short. Uh, <laughs> not, not only the matches as we were talking about before we got on air, yeah. but uh, also the season. Uh, any plans to go to Wimbledon? So I didn't, I didn't get any tickets in the ballot, but normally what I do is they release tickets the day before the night before um for the next day's play because people release tickets uh so it really depends if i can get someone the weekend then i can with work it might be difficult to suddenly or oh, oh, i call in six but cheeky isn't it? i don't think i'll be doing that sorry if anyone's listening from work i didn't, didn't say that <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but no no so hopefully hopefully i will um but yeah tbd tbd what about you you're not you're not coming here are you i will not be uh i will not be arriving at the all england club have you been before? Uh, hopefully soon. I have been. I went in 2019. Okay. Um, I, I I did a vlog about it um, back then. If you want to check that out, um, amazing. You know, I mean, every everything it's thought up to be completely unique. So uh, I miss it. Hope to be back soon. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we come down. What I don't live too far, so we can sort out a hit as well. It'll be fun as well. Why not? That would be great. Why not? Um, also, no, thank you. I appreciate that. I won't ask you your predictions for Wimbledon because I know you hate it when I ask you that and you also <laughs> decline to answer. So I'm not even going to bother this time. Uh, but no, thank you for being on, Gil. I really appreciate it. And hopefully we can catch up after Wimbledon. Uh, as always, great to chat to you. And all the best for the commentary with the TC and, uh, yeah, like rapid get rapid matches. So hopefully exciting times on the green stuff for you. Thank you so much for having me, as always. And, uh, you know, quick quick learner. You adapt. That's what makes you one of the goats, Faison. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gil. Appreciate it. All right. See you guys later. And, uh, yeah, remember to obviously check out Gil on Twitter, YouTube, all that good stuff. Thank you very much.